AMD. This is Biography. From AMD Studios in New York with Peter Graves. What is on second? Who's on second? No, who is on first? I don't know. He's on third now. We're not talking about him. It may be the most famous comedy routine of all time. And the men who performed it, one of the best love comedy teams of all time. For 20 years, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello brought the classic routines of burlesque to radio, movies, and television. And their performances of such old chestnuts as Crazy House and Who's On First made them superstars. The boys, as Bud and Lou were always called, even into their 50s and 60s, always left their millions of fans laughing. They still do. Who's on first, what's on second, I don't know is on third. You know the guy's I'll... name's on the baseball team? Yes. Well, go ahead. Who's on first? Yes. I mean the guy's name. Who? The guy playing first. Who? The guy playing first base. Who? <laughs> the guy on first base. Who is on first? Why are you asking me? I don't know. They just took it and made it magic. <laughs> and uh, when you get that perfect dynamic uh, differences between two people with that rhythm, it's just amazing. I'm not gonna go over there. You got no right to put me in a thing like that. Well, what kind of money? You're always putting me don't right in the middle of me. I don't care what kind of money. Don't you give me that lie. Listen, you got to over there with no arguments. I'm not gonna go over there with all those lies. I'm gonna start going the other way. I'm not gonna argue. Oh no, I'm not. You couldn't find two better comics than them. They were on top of each other. Zoom, 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 boom, boom, boom. They made me laugh. You know, I, I think they're very funny. You gotta say Roger. I'm afraid to say Roger. That's it. <laughs> Falling down makes people laugh. Being frightened makes people laugh. Tremendous physical damage makes people laugh. Well, that dog ain't no dentist. Abbott Costello are classic clowns. Don't watch me. Watch the Bud Abbott played a handsome, fast-talking con artist who could prove the hand was quicker than the eye. Lou Costello was the short, fat, sweet-natured sucker who wouldn't know what to do with a break if he got one. Come over here! Come on! Come on! Come over here! Together, they achieved a success that is unparalleled in show business. Former comedians in burlesque, Abbott and Costello conquered every entertainment medium from Broadway and nightclubs to radio, film, and television. Even from an early age, Bud and Lou seemed destined for show business. William Bud Abbott was born October 2nd, 1895 in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Bud's mother, Ray, was a bareback rider with a Barnum and Bailey Circus. Harry, Bud's father, worked for the circus troupe as an advance man. Soon, the Abbots moved to Coney Island, where Harry Abbott helped organize the first burlesque circuit. Bud would skip school to hang out around the Coney Island Carnival. My father didn't like school too much from what he told me. And he'd say to my, dad, my grandfather, Dad, I just, I just don't like school. School isn't just for me. I love that life, that carnival life. Bud Abbott dropped out of school at the age of 10 and was soon working as a shill for concessions at Coney Island. One job was to lure customers into the House of Mirrors where they'd usually get lost. Well, my dad knew how to go in and out of the mirrors and how to get out. So he used to take the people who would get lost and show them through the maz and help them to get out. For this service, he charged 10 cents. Already, Bud Abbott was establishing what would become his stage and screen character, the smooth-talking con man. At the turn of the century, body entertainment called burlesque was hugely popular. Strippers and scantily clad chorus girls were the main attraction. In between the singing and dancing, comedians performed risque routines. At age 16, Bud Abbott got his first job in burlesque as assistant treasurer for a New York burlesque theater. 
Young Bud was paymaster to such stars as Fanny Bryce and W.C. Fields. But my father used to tell me that he used to love to watch the different comics, and he'd go backstage, and he'd watch the shows, and he'd watch how the comics worked and how the straight men worked, and he was just, I guess he, he loved that. At the National Theater in Detroit, Bud Abbott graduated to producer, putting together one new show every week of gals and gags. Bud got to know all the classic burlesque routines, with names like Crazy House, Flugel Street, and Lemon Table. Then, after three years, Bud Abbott himself stepped on stage for the first time. He was a very strong, straight man. He treated his partners usually in a very rough and tumble manner on stage, hitting them and slapping them, and that would focus all of the audience's attention on the comedian, all their sympathy, and all the laughs would go to the comic instead of Bud, and that's what was great about Bud. He had this great generosity to give all of the laughs to the comedian. In 1918, Bud married a 17-year-old burlesque ingenue. Her stage name was Betty Smith. Bud teamed with Betty and then with several different comics as he traveled the burlesque circuit in the 1920s and 30s. His reputation grew, but real success eluded Bud Abbott. He just never seemed to find the ideal partner. Where did you come from? Madison, New Jersey. Louis Francis Cristillo was born on March 3, 1906 in Patterson, New Jersey. He grew up in a working class neighborhood. His mother, Helen, was Irish American. His father, Sebastian, was an Italian immigrant who worked as an insurance salesman. As a young kid, he was fascinated with Charlie Chaplin. That was his idol. Uh, I think that's what probably lit the spark that created the flame for him wanting to be an actor. From what I had heard, he had always wanted to be an actor, not necessarily a comedian, although he was funny as a kid. Uh, he used to ditch school to see the Charlie Chaplin films and uh, get caught by his father. <laughs> Lou claimed to have seen Chaplin's shoulder arms 25 times until he could perform every scene by rote. He just had quick humor and spontaneous humor, physical stuff, flops, he'd take falls and stumble, walk into a wall, bump his nose and all that sort of thing. Really, he had that shtick down perfectly. School was not one of Lou's main interests. It was in PS 15 that he adopted what would become his catchphrase. Mrs. Whitehead was our third grade teacher, a lovely lady, and uh, Lou in her class one day did something of a minor bit of mischief, and she told him to go to the blackboard, and really this is true, and write on the blackboard, they say 100, I think it was 50, write on the blackboard, I am a bad boy. And he did. Somehow or another, as years later, he, uh, when Bud would be chiding him about some fancy thing he was doing wrong, he said, I guess I'm a bad boy. When he was young, he was quite agile and very athletic. He was a champion foul shooter. He won the county cup three years in a row. He could sink that ball 99 out of 100. After finishing high school, Lou Cristillo, despite the objections of his family, hitchhiked to Hollywood. His burning ambition was to be a movie star, like his hero, Charlie Chaplin. I don't think he had a moment of doubt in his whole career where he was going and what he wanted to do. He was very focused from the very beginning. It was hard for him in Hollywood. Uh, it was tough. Uh, he slept in a lot of parked cars. Um, I guess he wasn't eating three square meals a day. And he really wasn't making it in Hollywood. Lou's athletic abilities finally landed him some stunt work at the MGM Studios. He doubled for actress Dolores Del Rio in the 1928 film, The Trail of 98. But soon after, broke and discouraged, Lou headed for home. He got as far as St. Joseph, Missouri, where he landed a job as a Dutch comic. In those politically incorrect days, the Dutch immigrants were the butt of a lot of jokes because they didn't understand the language and the double meanings of some words and had to, everything had to be explained to them. And that is the essence of Lou Costello. He's like an immigrant who's confused by language and words and directions. And so that was where he developed his persona. With this job, Lou Costello changed his name and became Lou Costello. 
He had a lot of respect for the actress, Dolores Costello, and I think that there was name recognition there, too. And also, um, if he failed, he didn't want to uh, go down as Costello. Lou Costello had never been on a stage before, but his natural ability to be funny earned him big laughs. He stayed at the theater for a year and then moved on to New York. In 1934, he met and married a 22-year-old chorus girl, Ann Battler. Then during the next few years, Lou Costello built his reputation until he was a top banana, a leading comic working with a straight man. On the burlesque circuit of the early 1930s, Bud and Lou's paths crossed many times. Both landed in New York's El Tinge Theater on 42nd Street in 1935. Here, the two men really got to know each other. Bud was watching him and realizing this guy is really talented, but nobody knows it because the straight man doesn't know how to handle him. He doesn't know how to pull him in and control him because Lou could go way out and, and come up with all sorts of wild improvisations, which were funny but took him out of the scene and Bud was saying to himself if this guy just had the, the right straight man he would be a sensation and then he realized I'm the right straight man even though they had other partners Bud and Lou sometimes performed together they were so good many people including Betty Abbott started to say why don't you team up my mother had seen Lou work and she really liked him she knew he was a funny little man and uh, she said Bud she said I think if you and Lou go together as partners, I, I can see that one day your names are going to be up on lights. In 1936, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello became partners one night over dinner with their wives. Betty Abbott's vision of fame for Abbott and Costello was about to become a reality in ways far beyond what she or they could ever imagine. The first years of the partnership were extremely busy ones. In 1936, Bud and Lou joined a New York burlesque review called Life Begins at Minsky's. Here they honed their routines and timing to become Abbott and Costello. You had the distraction of the strippers. You had to be funny right off the bat or the audience was going to boo you off. So it was a great training ground for Abbott and Costello. I think the weekly salary was $70 a week, $67 a week which wasn't bad compared with other people in the working stiffs, as we call them. Of the two partners, Bud made more money in a 60-40 split. His name goes first in Abbott and Costello because the straight man's name always went first because the straight man was considered the more valuable member of the team. And in fact, the straight man got more money. They'd make good by less comics. Whatever they did came out funny. So I went down, and there's these two guys on the stage, and they're doing a scene where every time they said an S, they sprayed in each other's face. So I sent them a telegram, sending a new ship and a spit for your act. So I got very friendly with them. Most Abbott and Costello routines were old burlesque classics that they performed over and over throughout their career, like the loafing bit. Yes, I got a job. I had to get a job. You don't want to work. What are you doing? I got a job in a bakery. Good. What are you doing there? Loafing. That's... <laughs> Loafing. Where? In the bakery. You working? Certainly. Doing what? Uh, loafing. Well, that's what I was doing here. I was just taking these. I was loafing. No, 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 no. That kind of loafing. You're just a lazy idiot. I was this here kind here. I was taking it easy, same as you. I work when I loaf. <laughs> Abbott and Costello did make one very important alteration to these old burlesque bits. They always kept their act clean. Their routines never contained any dirty language, commonly used by the other burlesque acts. They were smart enough to realize that they didn't need, you know, blue language in the routines to make them funny. They did it with their own patter, their own style, their own way of working. We fight this landlord to the last ditch. Wait, do we owe the attorney money? We have no attorney. What are we going to do without our attorney? <laughs> Sanitizing the old bits would eventually allow Abbott and Costello to reach new audiences. Women, kids, entire families. It was a move that would play a key role in their future success. Along the way, Bud and Lou picked up a bad habit common among performers in burlesque, 
To kill time and relieve boredom in between the five or so daily shows, they played cards. They were addictive, no question about it, and they played gin rummy. Small stakes, but just their hands were busy with cards, cards. But of the two, Lou was the more addictive, in my opinion. Lou had a go-for-it thing. In 1937, New York City shut down its burlesque houses. Off-color jokes and near nudity had created a public controversy. But already, Abbott and Costello had moved on to a lucrative career in vaudeville. They began a long engagement at Atlantic City's Steel Pier, where they were a big hit. What happened was you had all these old comedians doing these routines who never made it out of burlesque. But here, Abbott and Costello were doing the same material, but they were doing it so well that they were able to rise above burlesque with it. Abbott and Costello went on to play theaters and nightclubs, while a new kind of entertainment was becoming the rage. The Texaco Star Pit. Radio was the form of entertainment for the whole country. Uh, in that, there were shows that we all waited avidly for each week for our own, like we do today with television. But in those days, it was all over on radio. So the radio was big stuff. One of the most popular radio programs was Kate Smith's show on Thursday nights. Her manager, Ted Collins, had hired a young comedian who turned out to be a hit. Columbia Pictures wanted to do a test on me. But Ted Collins and Kate Smith wouldn't let me go unless I got a replacement. I go to Low State Theater, there's Abbott and Costello, years later. And they were doing Who's On First. All I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's left name and left field. Now what is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know, third base. <laughs> they closed my eyes. I said, geez, you can do this on radio. So Kate Smith and Ted Collins went down and bought them. That was the beginning of that big career. Millions of people had radios. And if you were a big hit, that was it. You hit the whole nation. Here they are, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. <laughs> After their first radio performance in February 1938, listeners complained that their voices sounded alike over the air. So Lou adopted a childlike falsetto that would become his trademark. Forget about it. Hey, never mind that. I'm a bad boy. Oh, skip it. Come here. One month after their radio debut, Abbott and Costello performed Who's On First? The origins of the routine are unknown. Just seems to be one of those ancient sketches common in the world of burlesque. Bud and Lou gave it a special flair. On paper, it really is not only not too funny, but kind of dumb. So the question is then, why did 57-year-old men laugh heartily at that? Why did I? It was in the timing and also in the emotional frustration. Well, I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? No, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. Don't mix them up. What is on second? Who's on second? No, who is on first? I don't know. He's on third now. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You just mentioned his name. If I mentioned the third base's name, who did I say play third? No, who's playing first? Never mind play. I don't know. What's the guy's name on third base? What's on second? Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> It was an amazing, huge hit. The switchboard lit up. And Ted Collins, Kate Smith's manager and the producer of the show, ordered them to repeat the routine every month on the show. And so it really got into the national uh, consciousness early on for them. Abbott and Costello became regulars on the Kate Smith show for a year and a half. Ironically, Lou had to persuade Bud that performing on radio was a good career move. Buddy was rather hesitant. Despite his persona of being such a know-it-all and had all the answers, he wasn't that way at all in reality. It was Lou who was the pusher. Lou had the, the ego, the, the, the belief in himself, strong, he had a strong sense of where he's going and what he wanted. Dad was a very patient man, very, very patient, and uh, I think maybe things might have started to move a little fast. He had worked his way up over those years to, to be secure in burlesque. And now with Lou, Lou wanted to take another step. A large part of Bud's lifelong reserve may be explained by an illness he developed in his late 20s, epilepsy. What scared him the most is that he would have a seizure in front of an audience. And uh, he never wanted that part to be exposed. Bud Abbott put aside whatever insecurities he may have had to appear with Lou in The Streets of Paris. This 1939 musical comedy review was the team's Broadway debut. 
According to critics, they stole the show. It wasn't long before Hollywood discovered Abbott and Costello. Lavishly produced, One Night in the Tropics brings you sparkling entertainment by radio's prize nitwits, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. I'm a bad boy! In 1940, Abbott and Costello signed a contract with Universal Studios. In One Night in the Tropics, their first movie, they served as comic relief. Five minutes of four, where is that guy? Maybe he's over my hotel suit. Not your suit, you're sweet. You're cute too, Abbott. I like you. It was a box office flop, but Abbott and Costello were so good in it that Universal consented to put them in a second film, one that would soon make them superstars. Wait a minute. What? Where's Herbie? Where's... <laughs> How did you get up in that tree? How did I get up in a tree? I sat on it when it was an acorn! Buck Privates was the second Abbott and Costello movie. In a silly series of events, Bud and Lou find they've been drafted into the Army. The picture's release in 1941 was perfect timing. That picture hit the market just as the draft had been put into place. The whole country was thinking about the draft. The film was shot in 20 days on the studio back lot for about $200,000. Practically overnight, Abbott and Costello became superstars. Buck Privates made something like $10 million when it first came out. Now, you, this is a time when a, you could buy a theater ticket for 50 cents. People don't realize how big this movie was. It was held over for weeks and weeks. One of the things Abbott and Costello often did was just incorporate old burlesque routines into the movies, and, and very often they had absolutely nothing to do with the plot. You're 40 years old, and you're in love with a little girl, say, 10 years old. This one's gonna be a pit. Well, wait till I finish. Now I'm going around with a 10-year-old girl. Well, wait a minute. You've got a good idea where I'm gonna wind up. The film-going audience had never seen any of these routines, which were old chestnuts, and Abbott and Costello could make it seem so spontaneous, no one realized some of these routines, you know, were 30 years old. Hello. One, two, three, four, bingo, quiet. Well, I had it. Never mind that. Let's show her arm. Let's show her arm. Let's Why don't you make up your mind? With the success of Buck Privates, other service comedies quickly followed. Abbott Costello basically always made B pictures. Even at the height of their fame, they made B pictures. Because Universal was not a studio known for its uh, lavishness. In fact, it was considered the cheap studio. It's amazing because their pictures just supported the studio for years. But they were never treated really well. They made a lot of money, but the budgets never really got high. In the early 40s, both men who came from poor backgrounds were now earning thousands of dollars a week. Bud and Lou didn't really know how to deal with this newfound wealth and success. They were big gamblers. They would gamble on a fly crossing the table. They gambled a lot on the set. They had buddies come in and play poker. While we're shooting, they'd go off to the trailer and Lou thought I was good luck. I saw $10,000 in the middle of the table. And Lou would sit there, he'd have a towel around him, he'd be sweating so much. And there was a little Greek guy that played him and made a living off of him. They were not the greatest gamblers in the world. <laughs> The boys' gambling continued at the racetrack and in Las Vegas. What had begun as innocent games of gin rummy back in burlesque became an addiction. By some estimates, Bud and Lou lost millions over the years, losses that someday would come back to haunt them. But now, the future looked very bright. 1942, they were number one at the box office, and in the following years, their salaries became uh, so astronomical that they were the highest paid stars in the world. It was typical. There were a couple of kids that just went to the candy store. That's what it was actually about. The new rich, the newly rich. They both bought lovely homes within a mile of each other, but they were competitive about their cars, their houses, their wives' coats and diamonds and all that, one trying to outdo the other. Once or twice a year, they'd have a big party, a humongous party, and I can remember my dad, he'd be walking out, you know, passing out $100 bills to people. 
I think basically the guy just wanted to help people. He, he felt he was fortunate enough to have made a lot. And if you needed it, he'd give it to you. I couldn't have had a better father. Um, I think he related very well to kids. Shoot me. Daddy. Bing! He was a little boy, you know, in, in a, in a grown-up body. It was a Camelot life. It was a fairy tale life, really, when I think about it. Even when I was really young, to the point where I can remember, uh, I knew there was something different about my family, you know, as opposed to what I saw when I went out. He was such a gentle man, very gentle, giving. I'd say he was the care giver of his family. The family was really his, his whole world. I had some friends who used to always say to me when I go to school, your father's always picking on Lou. He's always hitting Lou. But that was part of the act. You know, that was Abbott and Custode. In the 1940s, Abbott and Costello were a national craze. Not only were they movie stars, but they had their own radio show with NBC and continued to play clubs. Even Washington needed their services. When World War II broke out, Hollywood, including Abbott and Costello, pitched in to raise money. During that summer of 42, they visited 80 cities in a month and raised $85 million in, for the government in war bonds. They attracted huge crowds who came out to see them because they were so immensely popular. All the exhausting travel took a toll on Lou. At age 37, he became seriously ill with rheumatic heart disease, and it looked as though the partnership might come to an untimely end. For nine months, he languished in, in bed, and it was a terrible thing. It was right at the height of their career. Things were to have been done, and it was all put on hold. My father wouldn't continue because he said, if Lou's not here, I'm not going to be here. And uh, that's just how he felt. They were a partnership, and that's how it was going to be. Lou would be plagued with bouts of rheumatic fever for the rest of his life. But now, his health was improving. A steady stream of stars, including Lou's hero, Charlie Chaplin, wished him well during his convalescence. And he loved playing with his young son, Lou Jr., nicknamed Butch. In November 1943, just days before Butch's first birthday, the little boy accidentally drowned in the family pool. Lou Costello was changed forever. He was devastated. He was very depressed. He was a little less light in, t in, in nature, I believe, from that point on. It was, it was his Pagliacci. It was his tragedy. He never did get over it. I was to do Abbott and Costello in Hollywood. This was not too long after the death of his little boy. And he talked to me a lot about it. And I could see the, the hurt. And um, he had never known such desperation that it was hard for him to pour his heart out and then go on and be funny, and he didn't stop working, you know. Lou Costello's character was a little boy, essentially, and I think a lot of the little boy in Lou went out of his character after his son drowned, and I don't think he was ever really the same comedian. Abbott and Costello continued making movies at an incredible pace, sometimes as many as three or four a year. A lack of enthusiasm for their material began to set in. They resented the music in their movies, which took away from their own scenes, and they resented these um, boy-girl subplots that were foisted into all the, their films. They just wanted to get laughs. The years of working together day in and day out were beginning to create tension between the two men. Oh, oh. Don't smoke. Who's smoking? You are. What makes you think I'm smoking? Got a cigar in your mouth. Got my shoes on, but I ain't walking. Don't give me that. Will you stop that now? I just want to hit you once. Don't raise your hand. What are you waiting for? The on-screen Abbott and Costello relationship was always combative. But in real life, there was a warm, strong bond between them. 
they resolved problems very fast. If they had a fight on the set, they'd go outside and come back five minutes later and it was forgotten. But by 1945, the tension from nearly constant togetherness and the pressure to become more and more successful finally proved too much for the team. A year-long feud developed from a minor quarrel over a maid. Lou fired her, Bud hired her. Lou pushed Bud to fire her and Bud refused. So Abbott and Costello spoke to each other only while performing. Finally, Bud offered to help Lou raise half a million dollars to build a recreation center for underprivileged kids. The Lou Costello Junior Youth Foundation opened in Los Angeles in May 1947. By the late 40s, Abbott and Costello had made 25 films and their popularity was beginning to fade. And then, what catapulted them back into the box office top 10 in 1948 was a satire on horror movies. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Come on, take it all out. I like that movie a lot. That movie I'm fond of even beyond Abbott Costello because it treats the monsters with respect. The monsters are never objects of fun. What's funny is the situations and Bud and Lou's reaction to the situation. You have, again, classic Abbott Costello routines, you know, the, the whole thing of being frightened and spooks and stuff. With the smash success of this film, Universal put into production more Abbott and Costello horror movies. That one film, Abbott and Costello Me Frankenstein, really kept their careers going into the 50s, and then television picked it up for them by introducing them to a whole new audience. The Colgate Comedy Hour, starring the Abbott! On January 7, 1951, Abbott and Costello made their television debut guest hosting the Colgate Comedy Hour. The variety show was broadcast in front of a live audience. They were excited to do a live show again, where you get trapped, you make mistakes, you work your way out, you have a good time. My dad told me he enjoyed those shows more than anything else, simply because they were in front of a live audience again and, and just doing live stage. How do you milk a cow? You don't know how to milk a cow? No. You start from the back. From the back? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, we didn't rehearse that. Whoa. <laughs> the boys ensured their success in the new medium by doing those tried and true burlesque bits. No, you don't understand. You take the bucket and you put it under the cow's udder. Huh? You take the bucket and you put it under the cow's udder. The cow's udder what? <laughs> in their later years, their finest work is on television. You could see what they were like in vaudeville and burlesque in, uh, with a live audience, how they would play off the audience. How do you do? Oh, come right in, boy. Oh, get back there. Come through the door. Huh? What do you think they put doors in these things for? Come on, I'm here. Eh? Get in the door. Go ahead. But I got to come in the door. I'm here. It costs money to build these sets. Get in there. Get in, but... You come, go through the door. I don't have to go if I don't want to through the door. Go through the don't door. make me look silly. Go through okay, the door. okay, okay, okay. Okay, there. okay, okay. Come here. Get in there. Okay. They never really fully adapted to filmmaking process. You know, I mean, mentally they were always in burlesque and they wanted to hear the laughs. <laughs> While they continued to host many of the Colgate programs, their own TV series debuted on December 5th, 1952. I was a fan of theirs from the age of five when I first saw the television show. I mean, when that girl, the cue card girl comes out and puts the card over his face, that was hilarious to a five-year-old. I'm getting sick and tired of this. The 52 filmed episodes had a laugh track, but no plots. It was all just an excuse for the team to perform their best old bits. Uh, what do you want on Flugel Street? I want to find out where the Susquehanna Hat Company is. Susquehanna Hat Company? Yeah, that delivery hat. Is that a Susquehanna Hat? Sure. You know what I think of Susquehanna Hats? This is what I think of. Oh. They're just pure filmed records of classic burlesque routines. And done by a lot of the classic burlesque performers, the button whose cronies they would give jobs to. 
they were in control. They were in the driver's seat. This was their show. They were doing it the way they wanted to do it. They just wanted to get laughs, and that's what each show is. It's like 25 minutes of laughs. It's the best of what they did. You want me to back up? Back up. I'm going to back up. Go ahead. <laughs> what do you want me to do, Abbott? What do you mean? Go, go ahead. You want me to go ahead? No, no, no. I'm watching back here. You just told me to go ahead. No, I didn't, Lou. I want you to back up. I back up. Well, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There's an enthusiasm. It, 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 it's almost like going back in time, that show, 10 years earlier to when they were really enjoying making the movies. Whatever joy Bud and Lou got from doing their TV show was diminished by an event that would drastically alter their lives. In 1953, the IRS began auditing Abbott and Costello. They were very trusting guys, and they were good guys, generally, who would do anything for anybody. And they gave this guy a job to be their accountant, and the guy didn't file income tax for them, didn't take care of the books, and actually took money and went off to Mexico. And when the government, the IRS came knocking, they didn't have any of the receipts. They paid dearly for their years of generosity and their heavy gambling losses. My father lost everything, almost everything that took him 20-something years that, of his success to earn. He lost uh, our big home, his ranch, uh, everything that uh, they had, Lou, the same thing. I saw a change in my dad, and that was, uh, he never recovered from that, simply because of all they did for the United States government during World War II, and then have the IRS come back and use them as an example. It was like, my dad sort of felt he was stabbed in the back. For Abbott and Costello, this was the beginning of the end. Just a minute. Watch this dance with my Henry. Oh, what's on second? Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. He's, He's on, on third. third. He's on third, He's but on... I know who's on first. Who? Dance with me, Henry. Dance with me, Henry. Dance with me, Henry. Dance with me, Henry, released in 1956, was the 36th and final Abbott and Costello film. It was not a critical or a box office success. America was a little tired of them. They also were getting a little tired of themselves, of each other. There were rumors of Bud drinking heavily and of Lou not liking it. What people don't realize, he was an epileptic and he was taking medication. And in those days, they didn't know that medication affected alcohol like it does today. But dad worked straight. He was always straight. He drank after his work. It didn't matter. Lou, always ambitious, simply wanted to move on. I could sense that he, he wanted to do something of a more serious nature something more meaningful in his opinion no matter what i think dad just realized that that era of abbott and costello was over there was new comedy already you know coming in and i mean lenny bruce was almost ready to to click um i think the people wanted something different abbott and costello had been a team for 21 years but several months after dance with me henry was released lou ended the partnership and my father accepted it, you know? I mean, he said, if that's what Lou wants, fine. I remember sitting there and thinking, gee, no more Evan and Costello. I felt, I think, worse than my father in a way. I just thought it was sad. It was very sad. But in another way, deep down, I figured it was time. There was nothing else to do. They did everything. They did everything. Two of the funniest words in the language of show business are Lou Costello. Here's Lou in one of his comedy classic sketches. In 1957, Lou began making a series of solo appearances on The Steve Allen Show. We would build him into a big sketch. We surrounded him with the cream of the crop players, and we knew that if we put him into any funny situation, he would deliver the goods, and he always did. All right, here we go. Come on, let's try it, huh? All right, kid, hut, three, set. In 1958, Lou received good notices for his dramatic portrayal of a drunk in a TV episode of Wagon Train. He returned to comedy the next year in a film, The 30-Foot Bride of Candy Rock. Soon after, 
his dream to take on more serious roles was cut short. Lou, the loving father, was at home with his family when he suffered a heart attack. Him standing between the bedpost, clutching on to the, the, the two bedposts, and he was dripping wet. He was just in, in a sweat. And his coloring seemed to be very gray. And I remember him with his head down and turning and looking at me and trying to act very normal about it, but said, Christy, go get your mother. Lou Costello died March 3rd, 1959. He was 52 years old. I never saw my father cry in all the years. I had been with him as his daughter. And that day, he, he did break down and cry. And he said, I just lost one of the best friends of my life, you know. Bud Abbott remained largely in retirement until 1960, when he teamed with Candy Candido, a comic who resembled Lou. We rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. Now, I couldn't change one iota because Bud only knew it one way. And it was a wonderful experience for me learning, you know. And it was the best. He was a teacher. Oh, there was nobody better, believe me. He went out on the road for, with Candy for I don't know how many months it was, and that was it. And Candy was good. I mean, he was really good. But uh, there was only one Lou Costello. After suffering a series of strokes, Bud Abbott died of cancer in 1974. He was 78 years old. Had it not been for Abbott and Costello, most of the old burlesque routines would be lost forever. Their radio programs, films, and television shows preserved an entire era of American entertainment for generations to come. Bud and Lou's versions of these comedy classics have come down to us as the benchmark. Theirs is an astonishing legacy. They struck a common denominator in comedy that crossed every facet of show business and every age and every generation of Americans. <laughs> It's clean comedy and it's simple comedy. Everybody can understand it and appreciate it. <laughs> Abbott and Costello have influenced many great comedians. Jackie Gleason, Lucille Ball, Jerry Seinfeld, Martin and Lewis, the Smothers Brothers. One thing we learned from watching them is that the straight man is the one that carries the story, carries the... It carries a plot line and uh, makes it believable for anybody watching it. Hey, what kind of game is this? Oh, you never shot dice? No. Uh-oh. You never yeah. felt any sympathy, any sympathy at all for, yeah. uh, for Bud Abbott. And that's a high degree of compliment to say, I you really believe that guy. Go ahead. Whee! Seven. Seven. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I, I... I forgot to tell you, you don't pick it up right away. To me, those guys could read the phone book, and it's hilarious. There's something about them, the rapport they had. They were like peanut butter and jelly. They were meant to be a team. Another guy gets up and it's a long fly ball to be caught. Why? I don't know. He's not playing, and I don't give a damn. <laughs> I don't give a damn. Oh, that's my shortstop. <laughs> Although Bud and Lou never won an Oscar or an Emmy for their work, they have been rewarded with a rare honor. Their performance of the classic Who's On First routine is a permanent fixture at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Be right. Just a little. Be right a little. Be right a little. Hold it, hold it. Wait a little. Wait a little. Wait a little. Wait a little. Oh, Joe, you've got that cord. You've got it all. Yeah. It's all twisted. Oh, 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 oh. Turn it around. Turn it around to your right. Around to your right. Oh, around to your right. Oh, it's all twisted in the rack. Oh, around. Oh, oh, oh. Get out of my way. Are you coming? Come on. 